Psalm 118, verse 25. Psalm 118, verse 25. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Send now prosperity. Hallelujah. Can somebody say, Lord, send now prosperity. So we need to understand that the Lord sends prosperity upon his people. And remember, every time the Lord sends someone, uh, sends something or releases something in someone's life, there's always a purpose attached to it. The Lord does not do anything without a purpose. So the prosperity that the Lord will send upon your life is going to have a purpose. And the purpose is not just so you can live a very nice, comfortable life. Amen? The prosperity message has to come with a balance. I do believe in biblical prosperity, but we also have to remember to bring a balance because the devil takes everything to the extremes. So on one extreme, you got people that want to believe in total poverty and lack and, you know, they're against preaching of giving and tithing and prosperity and all of those things. And, and, and some of them are offended because of the excesses they have seen. Some of them, they just don't have the right proper doctrine and, and so forth whatever on one side you know they, they want to preach that and on the other side you go to the extremes where prosperity has become uh, nothing more than you know uh, uh, promoting greed to be honest with you promoting greed and promoting the lifestyles of the rich and famous and so we need to come to a balanced understanding of biblical prosperity if it's the Lord who sends prosperity and he sends it now, and we can ask the Lord, we can cry out, just like he says, save now. Do you believe that the Lord wants to save people? Amen. Do you believe that if you cried out for salvation, that the Lord is going to delay his salvation? Yeah. The Bible says, those who shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. And if you call upon the name of the Lord, you shall not be turned away. You shall not be ashamed. Amen. The moment you cry out on the Lord, Unto the Lord for salvation. He's going to come and save you. When you repent and you turn away from sin and you cry out to the Lord, save me now, O Lord. He's there to save. And if we believe that God is there to save, and if we cry out for prosperity, that God is there to prosper us. God is there to come and to prosper us. You need to understand that. It's a part of the gospel. I'll be preaching to you about the blessing. Last week we talked about the blessing. That the blessing of the Lord makes one rich. And the Lord... God himself preached the gospel to Abraham. That's Galatians 3, 8. In your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. So the gospel is the blessing of the nations. The gospel is the blessing. The gospel is us receiving the breath of God to be empowered with God, to be filled with God. Amen. The gospel is about us being empowered to multiply, to be fruitful, to have dominion. When Adam and Eve fell, they did not lose a religion. They lost dominion. So religion is not what we need. We don't need religion. We didn't lose religion. So we don't need religion. We need dominion. We need the blessing. They lost the blessing. They were kicked out of the garden. They lost the access to the blessing. Amen. So we need to be blessed. The gospel is the blessing. The good news is the restoration of the blessing of God upon the nations, upon the Gentiles. Amen. Amen. Having been redeemed from the curse of the law. Because Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Being made a curse for us. Amen. Because the curse came from a tree and the curse went back on a tree. For curse is everyone that hangs on a tree. So that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles. Any Gentiles here today? We're all Gentiles. We're all from the nations. Amen. Amen. That the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles. Amen. Amen. So God's covenant of blessing that he made with Abraham, which was an eternal covenant. We saw that in Genesis chapter 17. He made an eternal covenant, an everlasting covenant with Abraham, a covenant of blessing, an everlasting covenant of blessing with Abraham and his seed. And who are the seed of Abraham? Those who are of the faith of Abraham are the seed of Abraham. Amen. Amen. Remember when John the Baptist was preaching, the Pharisees came and said, we are the children of Abraham. And John the Baptist said, God can raise up children, of, children from these stones. Amen. Amen. So... The children of Abraham are not the physical offspring of Abraham, but they are the spiritual offspring of, offspring of Abraham, those who have inherited the promise, those who have received by faith the breath of God and the blessing of God, 
amen, are in the family of God, amen, are saved, born again, washed in the blood of Jesus, filled with the Holy Ghost. Those are the spiritual offspring, offspring of Abraham. And those, and we are supposed to live by faith. The just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. The righteous shall live by faith. And we are called to live by faith. And Abraham's faith is given to us as the example. Because he was a man just like us. Amen. So why Abraham? Because he was a man who was under his father's dominion, father's house. And the Lord spoke to him and said, leave your father's house. Go where I will tell you to go. There I will bless you. Amen. And he launched out on a, a journey of faith. Amen. So faith is a journey. And, and prosperity is also a journey. All right. And I'm going to show you something about that. Prosperity is a journey. It's not something that just happens overnight. You can send now, God will send now prosperity, but you have to walk in it, and it's something you grow in it. Amen. You have to grow in prosperity. You're not going to start at the top. And everybody's at different levels of prosperity. And you can keep growing. You can go to the next level. You can keep going to the next level. You can keep going from glory on to glory. But there's a lot that you're going to have to do to be involved in that. And so we have to understand that. And the number one thing we need to understand is the purpose of prosperity. If we cry out to the Lord, Lord, send now prosperity. Why? Why do you want prosperity? What is the reason? What is the purpose? Because God doesn't do anything without a purpose. The anointing always comes for a purpose, to accomplish a mission. Amen. The anointing is the supernatural equipment to get the job done. So you have an assignment. You have a heavenly assignment. Whatever your assignment is, is what God's called you to do. And that's the only thing you're going to have to give an account for. When you stand before the Lord, He's going to ask you to give an account for what He has placed in your trust, what He has placed in your hands to be a steward of. And if you have been a good steward, you will hear, well done, good and faithful servant, enter now into the joy of the Lord. That's the only thing God's going to ask you to, to do is to fulfill what He's asked you to do. The assignment for your life. And so prosperity is attached to the assignment that you have for your life the reason many christians don't prosper is because they're out of the will of god they're out of their calling amen and i have defined for you biblical prosperity and i will get to that but go with me to third john chapter 2 or verse 2 i'm sorry third john 2 third john 2 Beloved, any beloved here today? I wish, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. Okay, so here's a prayer. Here's a prayer of the Apostle John. Speaking to the church, speaking to the beloved, speak, speaking to the family of God, to the children of the Heavenly Father. Beloved, the beloved of the Father. And he says, I wish or I pray above all things. Above all things. So there are many things, but above all things. So this is a very high level of purpose attached to this. All things are there, but then there's this thing above all things. And I talked about the high life. The low life versus the high life. Remember that? Yeah. Amen. So if you want to live the high life or be above all things, prosper above all things. Amen. That you may prosper above all things and be in health. So now health, this is talking about physical prosperity. Okay? Even as your soul prospers. And now it's talking about prosperity of your soul. Okay? Now I'm going to qualify those. Now, the word used for prosperity in the New Testament, the Greek word is you adao. You adao. It's a combination of two words. The word you, which means good or well. And then the other Greek word is hadas, which means a journey. So really the word prosperity means a good journey. A good journey. So I told you there is this concept or aspect of a journey attached to prosperity. It's not just something that happens overnight. That's where a lot of people miss it. That's how the world system operates. Everybody's trying to get rich quick. And there are many get rich quick schemes out there. And people get sucked into those things. I'm sure every week you get some email from somebody promising you millions of dollars, right? Yeah. And it's amazing. It's amazing. 
that for, for years, that thing, that those kinds of scams have been running, and people still fall into that. You know why? Because there are enough gullible, greedy people out there that will fall into those traps. Why are those scammers still using the same old methods that supposedly everybody knows about? Because it works. Why does the devil use the same temptations? Why has he been using the same temptations for centuries on mankind? Because they work. Because he knows human nature. And there are only three temptations, three kinds. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. That's why he came and tempted Jesus in three different ways. And when Jesus overcame all three, the devil said, well, I've got nothing else. Those are the three I always use, and they work. And so I guess I've got to check out of here, and I'll look for another opportune time to see if I can use those three on you again, see if you will fall for it. Once he's used those three, he's, all, he's out of He played all his cards. It's over. All the cards are on the table, buddy. That's it. But the thing is, it works. Don't love the world, the world system. What is the world system? Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, the pride of life, or the pride of riches, the pride of gain. Amen? Amen. So, prosperity means a good journey. Well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. Prosperity means well done. You are, you are well done. You have done well. You have run your race, and you have finished your race. You've run it well, and you've finished it well. That's what Paul talked about. I've run my race. I'm about to finish my, way, my race. And my race that I've run on this earth, I've always run it for a heavenly prize. Not an earthly prize, but a heavenly prize. I am, I, there's a crown waiting for me. There's a crown laid up for me in glory. I'm running my race for that incorruptible crown. I'm not looking for a crown from men. I'm not looking for a medal from men. I'm looking to be rewarded by my heavenly father. And I run my race. And he goes, in order to make sure that I have not run my race in vain on a daily basis... I have buffeted my body. I've taken over control over my flesh. I have, I have killed my flesh. I have crucified my flesh on a daily basis to make sure that the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life does not get me into a ditch where I'm sidetracked or I fall into a ditch and I'm, I'm shipwrecked, that I run my race in vain. Amen? And he talks about one of his disciples. Remember in one of his uh, letters he says i can't remember the name of the disciple maybe somebody will remember but he says he loved the world he left me he loved the world more than more than the ministry anybody remember the guy's name Phineas? no i think that was the guy in the old testament who got smoked from the fire Hophni and Phineas. strange fire guy isn't he you know what strange fire is, right? It's the, per, the flesh parading itself as the spirit. It's the hype of the flesh is the strange fire. Looks like fire, but it's not fire. There's a lot of strange fire in churches too. People trying to put on the appearance of having the fire, but it's not the fire. It's really the flesh. It's the hype of the flesh. Fake it till you make it. Amen. But they never make it, really. Everything's fake. So... The word prosperity has to do with a good journey. We're running a race. Even though send now prosperity, it's not like we're just going to take this prosperity and go do our own thing. There is a purpose attached to the prosperity. The reason the Lord wants to provide an abundance in our lives is so that we can fulfill our calling. We can run our race and run it well. Amen. Run it well. When you're running a race... If you're not drinking enough water, if you're not getting enough supply of minerals and water or whatever, your body's going to start to wear down and you're not going to be able to finish your race. So the Lord wants to make sure that you are supplied, well supplied with the nourishment of the anointing, the Holy Spirit, and the material resources that you need and be in health physically. Because how can you serve the Lord when you're bedridden? You can't even get out of bed. When you're totally depressed, when your body is being destroyed by cancer here is a man from uh, uh, pastor mary Hofton's church in 1994 i've shared this a few times with the church i don't even if you remember this is the pastor I'm, i've talked about from world harvest church 1994 he was diagnosed with cancer and they gave him just a few months to live 
He's still kicking. The fire of God came on him. The fire of God came on him. He was stuck to the floor under the anointing. The fire of God burned out every trace of cancer from his body. And he's still running. Totally cancer free. Because he's got a calling. And he's got to reach the nations. And that's one of the... I mean, that church is... I mean, the most mission-oriented church I've ever seen. Everything's about missions in that church. I mean, missions, 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 missions. And the last time I was there, it was their missions weekend, and I preached, and they were marching with all the flags of the nations. And then uh, somebody marched in with the Turkish flag. I just broke down. I just <laughs> began to weep. I mean, you know, but there were so many flags that came in. I mean, it was amazing. Uh, how many nations are you guys are involved in? 57 nations they're involved in. A local church with a global vision. That's what I call it. It's a local church with a global vision. And, and it's, not a, it's not a huge, huge, it's not a mega church of thousands of people. What is it, 800? 11, 1,200 total members. So, I mean, you've got churches that have 10, 15, 20, 30,000 members that don't do anything, really. Yeah. I mean, they do any missions. It's to London or to Paris or Hawaii, Hawaii or Australia <laughs> or, the Cari- or the Caribbean. Uh, or the Caribbean, and then these guys, so-called prosperity preachers, and then, you know, they talk about preaching the gospel in the nations, but you can't get them to your nation because they have to be guaranteed $10,000 a night. They ha- you have to put them in the presidential suite of the top five-star hotel and everything. I mean, you know, and then they, t- they talk about missions. Come on, give me a break. You ain't gone on missions until you've gone 70 hours in a van, you know, uh, uh, 300 yards from the Russian art- artillery. I mean, that's missions. You, you got to push the edge. You haven't been preaching the gospel until you've been arrested and beaten for it and had a gun put to your head and had documents put in front of you, false accusations, and if you don't sign them, they say they'll pull the trigger and there's a policeman with a gun to your head. And then you have to, the Holy Ghost rises up on the inside of you and say, go ahead, pull the trigger. I know I'm going to heaven. Where are you going to go? And three days later, that same policeman comes breaking down, weeping. You're behind bars. You're more free. He's outside, but he's all bound, and he's weeping, saying, please pray for me. I'm, I'm going to go to hell. I've done some evil things. Please pray for me. And you lead him to the Lord, and five minutes later, you're released. After three days of going without food or water, lying on the concrete, cold concrete, in the middle of winter, getting pneumonia from it, having to believe God for your healing, having a cough for three months. Hey, that's, that's missions. Not fly, flying around the world in a private jet and and staying in five-star hotels excuse me and i'm you know again i'm i'm not against prosperity if you need a jet you need a jet but you know if you need a car you need a car you can have a nice car amen or you can be chauffeured in a rolls royce i don't know why preachers have to be chauffeured in a rolls royce i just don't get that because i mean the way i i see things differently because I, I look at that Rolls Royce and I think about all the orphanages and all the children and all the churches you can build in the mission field. Because I'm, I'm a missionary. God sent me here on a mission to a nation. And so I'm not here just to believe God for some personal stuff. I'm here to see a nation shaken. I'm, I'm here to see people touched. Amen. I'm here to see something. And so I want to bring a balance in some of these things. So it's a good journey. It is about a journey. And Abraham, he started out on a journey. Amen? He started out on a journey. And when he started out, he had nothing. Remember, he had to leave his father's house. He left with nothing. I came here with one suitcase 19 years ago. Didn't know anybody. Didn't have any support. Nobody believed him. Didn't have any partners. Nobody knew me. So when you start, on, start out on a journey, it's like you're starting from zero. And actually, I'm looking back, I think I, I, didn't, I wasn't even at zero. I think I was at like minus 10. <laughs> I had to crawl my way up to zero. It took me a couple of years just to get to zero. You know. And then you come to a country where there's 500 Christians. And then the missions publica- publications at the time, 1996, called Turkey the largest unreached nation in the world. Statistically speaking, the number of Christians to the entire population, the born-again Christians to the entire population, was the smallest percentage in the world. When I came in 1996, there were only 10 churches meeting in houses or shops. That, that was it. 
We didn't even have the Old Testament in the Turkish language. Imagine that. 1996, we didn't have the Old Testament in the modern Turkish language. It wasn't even published till 2001. It was in the second year of the church, we actually got the Old Testament. We got the full Turkish Bible in the new language. And now we got missions organization, well, two mission organizations coming in to retranslate the Turkish Bible, taking out the Father and the Son and everything that will be offensive to Muslims to make a Muslim-friendly Turkish translation. That's what we're having to deal with. And can you imagine the, all the money that's sunk into that mess? Taking out father, taking out son, taking out things that would be offensive to the Muslims. And then using uh, uh, verses from the Quran and the footnotes as a reference to the Bible. Trying to make it sound like, well, actually, to be honest with you, some of these guys actually believe that we serve the same God. And that's, that's, that's the, the, one of the biggest deceptions here of the end time. But that doesn't surprise me because we are going to end up with a one world Government, one world money system, and a one world religion. And we got enough peddlers of the one world religion going around all over the world peddling, peddling their demonic, luciferian filth, and many just eat it up. Many eat it up in the name of unity. Unity. Let's all hands together and sing, we are the world. We are the children. So this is, the, this is what we're dealing with right now. So prosperity. Good journey. Turn to your neighbor and say, have a good journey. That's what we say in Turkish. When somebody's leaving. One of our greetings in the Turkish language. We, have, we are a very ancient people of the Middle East area. So we, a lot of our stuff even goes back to biblical times. And, and, and the funny thing is, it's hard for the Western mindset to understand a lot of biblical things. Because the, the Bible was not written in America or in Europe. The Bible was written in the Middle East to Middle Eastern people of very different culture. So you really have to understand a lot of different things. You have to, you know, the way you have to look at the Bible in a different perspective. So we can't look at the Bible. It's not an American gospel. It's not a European gospel. It's not an African gospel. It's not a Korean gospel. It's the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And our culture is not an earthly culture. Our, our, our culture is culture of the kingdom. So we have to establish prosperity according to the culture of the kingdom of God. We have to have a kingdom perspective. Jesus said, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. So in order to see truly prosperity in God's way, you have to see it through kingdom perspective. And you have to have revelation. Your eyes have to be opened. The eyes of your understanding must be opened by the Spirit of God to really clearly see this. And it cannot be tainted by the world system. And it cannot be tainted by the flesh. Now, I spent a lot of time here exposing the world system. If you've heard me preach on these things, you've heard me talk about exposing the world system. If you haven't heard me, all of that stuff is on our website. We have hundreds and hundreds of hours of quality, HD quality video, all the sermons, everything is archived on our website. If you go there, you search. I don't even know how many sermons are on there now. You can download MP3s. You can watch the videos. I mean, there must be over 300 there probably, guys, huh? Yeah, I get a thumbs up there. So, Since 2008, all, every, just about 2009, everything's on there for seven, eight years worth of stuff. So now... I've spent a lot of time exposing the world system. And, and we know, what is the world system? The world system is a pyramid scheme. It's a pyramid scheme. What is a pyramid scheme? There's very few at the top of the pyramid. The base is wide, and it's very narrow at the top. The world system is designed to monopolize and control and to gather up all the power and the wealth in the hands of the few elite at the top. So there is an inequality of wealth distribution in the world system. 2% of the world controls, or 2% of the population controls 98% of the wealth. Is that right? So it's somewhere around there. 
and I've heard different numbers like 1% control 95 and all that kind of stuff. And, but, so that's the world system. There is a tremendous injustice and inequality in the distribution of wealth in the world system because it's ungodly. Those who sell their soul to the devil at the top, serving Lucifer, are the ones that control the money and the power and the decision. And actually, the way they look at the rest of the mass is they look at them as dumb sheep. They, this, is, this is how they actually think. That they are the ones who should have all the power and the decision making because people are stupid and they don't know how to make decisions. So they're going to make decisions for them and the people are their slaves to work for them. Even though they think they're working a job in a company or they're working a job and whatever, just working a decent job, paying their taxes or whatever, really it's, it's a form of modern day slavery because they're never going to really rise up or be allowed to rise up. So if you try to do it in the world system, yes, you can get rich quick overnight. There are a few ways to do that, but you'll have to sell your soul to the devil and you will lose your soul and you'll lose everything in the end. And you will end up in hell. You will end up in the lake of fire. I guarantee that. I 100% guarantee. Because I know the word. I know the word. That's exactly what will happen. But to rise up in the spirit of God, in the power of God, in faith, you're going to have to fight the good fight of faith. You're going to have to fight through, to break through. Because there are going to be many, 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 many hindrances and barriers and structures and boundaries that have already been set in place. Systems and structures set in place that will not allow you to just walk in and just take it. You're going to have to face those giants in the promised land. And you're going to have to take them out. There are going to be many, many, many giants. And there are going to be many, many walled cities. You're going to have to take. But you're going to, so you have to have the power of God to prosper and to rise up. Because we are in the world, but we are not of the world. And we are surrounded by a system that's wicked and ungodly and anti-Christ. Anti-anointing. And the only way to, listen, overcome the anti-anointing is the anointing. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The world system is an antichrist system. But it is a demonic system. And it does, demons do have power. But, oh, shabro sekenda mayanda, romo shekia, rende, compared to the Holy Ghost on the inside of you. All the hordes of hell can, be, can come together. It cannot even be a speckle, speck of dust under the fingernail of the Holy Ghost. So you have the Holy Ghost on the inside of you. You have the power and the authority to rise up and to break through. And you can have a good journey. But I'm not saying that you're going to have an easy journey. This is where a lot of people miss it. They think be, prosperity is just having a very easy, comfortable life. That is not true. If anybody tells you that, they're lying to you. That is not the gospel. Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. They will hate you for my namesake. They try to kill you. They'll take you before courts and accuse you and, and they'll come after you. They'll criticize you. They'll attack you. Amen? In this world, you will have much tribulation. But don't lose courage. Don't be disheartened because I have overcome the world. I've overcome this system. So Jesus operated outside of the system. Even when they came asking for the temple tax, he did not go to the money changers to get the temple tax. He got it from the mouth of the fish. Supernatural provision. So Jesus operated outside of the system. Money changers was the banking system. They made the money. They coined the money. They controlled the money. They controlled the money supply. They controlled the exchange rates. They had a monopoly on the money supply. And so to get money, you had to go to them in the world system if you operated according to that system. But when they came to them in Capernaum, when they came to Peter asking for the, the tax, the half shekel uh, tribute tax, which was basically an illegal tax. Most of the taxation is illegal anyways. And they lie to you and they tell you that it goes to social services, this and that, and all of that kind of stuff. 99% of the income tax collect, collected in the United States goes to the Fed to pay off the debt of the, on the, of the national debt. 1% is the administrative fees. Because the same year they set up 
the Federal Reserve in 1913 is the same year they put an amendment to the U.S. Constitution to establish the income tax, the federal income tax, and then the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service, which is the tax collecting agency, which is a private corporation, by the way, just like the Federal Reserve is a private corporation. So these are private corporations. And what's the job of a business? To make profit. And the more profit they make, the more they prosper. And the more the people lose. So the, that's the whole system, is to collect all the wealth and the control in the hands of the few elite. Now, unfortunately, the Lord recently spoke to me, beginning to show me something. The same kind of system has crept into the church, and that really bothers me. Because I do believe in biblical prosperity. But I do not believe in prosperity for just the few. Where all the money and the wealth and the influence and the fame and the fortune is collected in the hands of the few celebrity preachers. That's exactly how the world system is. It's a pyramid scheme. And I am sick and tired of seeing that same stinking devilish pyramid scheme in the church. When you look at biblical prosperity... God wanted his, all of his people to prosper. Yes. And listen, the wealth was distributed evenly. Even when, listen, listen, think about it. Even when the, he gave them manna, it was for every day and everyone had enough to eat. And when they tried to collect too much for the next day, it perished. So they had to trust the Lord every day and the Lord made sure that every single person was fed equally every day when they got greedy and tried to collect it all to themselves it perished and we have a lot of people perishing right now because they're getting greedy and they're trying to collect it all to themselves and they call it dreaming big uh, how can i not dream big no i'm not against dreaming big but the dream has to come from god the dream has to be a heavenly vision the dream has to be divine. Can't be of the flesh. So there are some limits. Because God gives to everyone a measure of faith. According to the grace, the measure of the gift of Christ given unto you. So whatever your calling is, you're going to have a measure. If God sends you to reach a, a village, you need a certain measure. If God sends you to reach a city, small city, you need a measure. But to go to a big city, you need a bigger measure. If God sends you to a nation of 2 million people, your measure is going to be a whole lot different than a nation of 200 million people. Because the work is different. There are different levels of work, different, different uh, uh, um, scales of influence. and So there's a different measure. So you have to understand your measure. And according to the measure of the gift of Christ, the Lord will provide for you because here is the definition of biblical prosperity. Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Is this helping anybody here today? Yes. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 8. And listen to this. If anybody asks you, do you believe in prosperity? You say yes. I believe in biblical prosperity. And you show them this verse. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you. Amen. Everyone say all grace. all grace. That sounds really good, doesn't it? All grace. That you, always having all sufficiency in all things, Anybody like the idea of always having all sufficiency in all things? And look at this. May have an abundance for every good work. And I want to call that every God work. May have an abundance for every God work. You got to make sure that you're doing God's work. You got to be busy with the Father's business. You got to be busy with the Father. When you're doing the Father's business... You are going to be abundantly supplied for the work that he's called you to do. Amen. And that is the definition of biblical prosperity. Having a good journey. Having an abundance for every good work. Having received all grace 
in every situation to have, a, have all sufficiency, to be sufficient, to be sufficient for what God's called you to do. So you have to make sure that you are following God's plan and purpose for your life. Number one, that's, that's, you have to be on the right journey. <laughs> you, you can't be on the wrong journey. Amen. Amen. If he says go to Nineveh, you can't be getting on a boat. I don't care how expensive the boat is. It can be a five-star cruise boat to Tarshish. I don't care how. It could be the the most luxurious boat on the planet and it's going to sink. You're going to end up in the belly of the fish. And I wouldn't call belly of the fish prosperity. That's not a very good journey. Prosperity for the fish. Thank you. My comic relief sitting on the front row here. This guy is funny. You should hear some of the stuff he says. The fish was prospering, feeding on the disobedient prophet. Now, let's be, let's be real about this. Jonah died. You don't end up in the belly of a fish for three days, in the, swimming in the gastric juices of a big fish. You, he died. And that's what Jesus said. The sign of Jonah is what will be given. He was dead for three days, and God actually resurrected him. Because the Bible says he went down to Sheol, which is the place of the dead. So he actually died and was resurrected back to life on the third day when he finally repented. And the funny thing is, he goes to Nineveh, he preaches, they repent, he gets upset. <laughs> this guy is, this guy, I mean, my God, he can't even rejoice that the people repented. He gets offended with God that they repented because he wanted them destroyed. For the evil that they had done to Israel. You know, I mean, so. <laughs> I mean, this is crazy. This is a prophet. This is a prophet of God. Really called and anointed of God. But God says, go to Nineveh. He's on a boat to Tarshish. Amen. So, I don't care what you're driving. I don't care what you're flying in. I don't care if you're walking or how you're getting there. You just got to make sure that you're on the right journey. Whether it's a bicycle, a car, or an airplane, or a boat, it, you, you want to make sure that you're on the journey that God sent you to be on. Amen. And I'll just get real, very real with you right now. This is my 16th year of pastor in this church, and we are our international church. And I've seen a lot of Jonas here in Istanbul. <laughs> a lot of Jonas. They come into me, I say, what are you doing here, buddy? Oh, they tell me a story, and I'm just like, it's a Jonah right there. I'm, I'm dealing with a Jonah. This is going to be trouble. It's going to be trouble. I mean, he's going to get offended. When people repent, he's going to get offended. I mean, with everything. He's just on the, he's on the wrong. He's not he's even supposed to be here. And I've told some people, go back to your country. You need to get back. You need to go back. No, oh, they get offended with me. No, I'm not going back. So go back. No, I'm not going back. And no, I'm going to go over here. I've, I've got to get to Greece. I've got to get to Germany. I've got to, they always got to get somewhere. And it's like, hey, stop, buddy. Where does God want you to be? Oh, they're not interested. They don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear. Where does God want you to be? No. So here's what I tell them. Look, you're, you're here now in the belly of the fish. Stay here until there's a resurrection. Don't make mistake upon mistake. You know, two wrongs don't make a right. So if, you may, if you're in the wrong place, at least stay here. And the reason you're here, because you don't know how to hear the voice of God. So stay here and grow spiritually. And the Lord will give you the grace to stay here and grow. When you're hungry and thirsty for Him, He'll give you the grace to grow in grace and stay here until you are able to hear the voice of God. Because if you can't hear the voice of God, don't do anything. Don't step into something out of the flesh. Don't come here with your own plan and expect to prosper. Come on, guys. I'm, I've got to get real with you. Because I, I, I can just say, hey, everybody run up here and put $1,000 and you'll prosper. I'll be lying to you. And I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to fleece the sheep. I'm going to tell the sheep exactly how it goes. Because if you don't get some things right in your life, I, I don't care how much money you throw down here at my feet. I don't care how much money you throw at the apostles' feet. You're not going to break through until you get some other things right in here. Yes. Here and here. Yes. you got to prosper in your soul. It's the way you think. It's the way you think. It's your will. 
Your mind, your will, your emotions. You got to make sure that your will is submitted to the will of God. You can't force your own will on God. You have to be changed by the renewing of your mind to understand the good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God. Amen. And be submitted to the will of God. And you got to crucify your own flesh, your own desires, your own plans. Amen. Amen. And just bring your plans to the fire. Say, Lord, send your fire. Burn up everything that is not of you. That's a dangerous prayer. Be careful when you pray that. God, send your fire. People come, I want your fire, Lord. No, do you really want God, the fire God? Because when the fire God comes, even your clothes might burn off and you'll be standing there in your underwear. I mean, naked. I mean, you're going to get exposed. I mean, you know, because everything that is not of God is going to burn up in the fire. Are you sure you know what you're praying? Oh, you just want to roll on the floor and have a good time in church. That's not... The purpose of the fire, the purpose of the fire is to purify you, your motives, the way you think, the way you see things, purify the vision. Jesus speaking to the lukewarm church in Laodicea said, come, come to the fire. Come to the fire so that I may anoint your eyes so that you can actually see. The fire is going to purify the way you think, you see things. You're going to have clear heavenly vision. All the clutter all the confusion, all the things added of the flesh, things added on, but because of family or this or that or some friend you want to please and some girl you want to please, some guy you want to please. Because stuff gets piled on top of I mean, sometimes people start up with the thing, you know, with, with the vision of God. And then by, by the time all the other stuff gets added to it, my God, they're walking around in Saul's armor. They're 500 pounds. Look like a big 500 pound sumo wrestler. All the fat. All the fat added on. No, you got to trim down. You got to be lean to run the race. You can't run the race with all this fat on you. My, my wife was showing me the picture of this woman. I don't even know where you found it. It's this woman. She's like... 350 kilo or something, lying in bed. I mean, my God, I have never seen anything like this. You could take the belly and use it as a blanket. She could just flop her belly over herself as a blanket. I mean, I have never seen anything so gross in my life. And then they, they have to have this forklift to lift her out of bed and stuff. I mean, her bed ha is made out of steel, fortified with industrial-grade steel. Otherwise, I mean, you know, it's, you can't put her on a regular bed. But I mean, you know, <laughs> squash it. she's going to squash it like a bug. I mean, you can't do anything like that. And people are like that in the spirit. If you saw them, they might be nice and trim on the outside, you know, looking all sharp and spiffy. But their soul is fat i mean their soul is just so fat i mean their soul is just so piled on with all the additives fat and just junk and i mean it's like they can't even move they can't even believe god it's confusion total confusion in the mind and they don't even know which journey they're on and they're pulled in every other every direction and then, you know, you watch these people and every month they get a new vision. Nothing bothers me more than that. Especially the charismatics. Every month they get a new prophecy, a new vision, a new dream. One month they're here and then God told me to do this. Next month they're over here because they just had another vision or something. And they're, they're so unstable. Amen. Amen. And then you get like a Baptist or somebody who doesn't even know anything about visions or dreams. They just stay somewhere for 20 years, 25 years. They don't do much, but they at least stay. I mean, you know, some, amen. At least they're consistent. Because all they know to do is have a quiet time in the morning and pray and, and read the scriptures and 
The charismatics, they, they don't even read their Bible. You know, they just run from prophecy conference to prophecy conference and some other new thing. And I mean, it's just crazy. It's crazy. Amen. And Pentecostals, oh my God. I mean, you know, they can pray in tongues so loud you can hear them from a mile. My God, walls tremble when they pray. Amen? Pray, 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 pray all night. Amen? But then there's other stuff. You know, there's other things you got to deal with. It's not just, you can't just pray all night and expect everything to change because you have to change. So you can spend all this time praying that God will change your circumstances. But God doesn't change circumstances. He changes people. He changes people so that they can go and change their circumstances. Because as a man thinks, so is he. So if your, your mindset doesn't change, your circumstances are not going to change. Amen. Amen. So prosperity has to be in your soul. Amen. Your mind, your will, and your emotions need to prosper. Your, your physical body needs to be in health and strong. Amen. Amen. So that means you've got to take care of the temple. Eat properly, exercise. I mean, take care of the temple. Amen. So healing doesn't just come from prayer. Amen. You got to eat properly. You got to take care of yourself. All that other stuff. Hallelujah. Everyone say a good journey. Good journey. Okay. Is this helping anybody? Yes. I was actually, I'm just, I thought I was going to go a little different direction, but I'm right back to this stuff. Can't get away from it. That's what people need to hear. 1 Corinthians 16. Go with me to 1 Corinthians 16. We'll read through verses 1 and 4. So we got to make sure that we're on the right journey. Not the wrong journey. Fulfilling our calling, not somebody else's calling. Not copying somebody else. Amen. Not trying to be like somebody else. Not trying to be something or someone that somebody else wants us to be. Amen. I've seen a lot of kids in Bible school because their parents put them there. When we were in Bible school, there were, there were some young kids there straight out of high school because their parents put them there. And they sat in the back and never took notes and talked the whole time. But they went to Bible school. So you can go to Bible school, but, amen, you can be in Bible school, but Bible school has to get in you. The Word has to get in you. Amen? The Word doesn't get in you. You can sit there and even get your certificate. You can memorize all the scriptures and do well on your test and, and get your diploma, but you, all you got was a piece of paper. You didn't get anything else. Because there has to be an impartation. Something has to be imparted into your life. And, and, the, and, and the time in, your, in the Bible school, it's a time of change. And our Bible school is designed to where it's change. Amen. It's, a, it's about a change. How many Bible school students here, current or past or present? Let me see. Everyone stand up. RBI students or graduates of River Bible Institute. And, and uh, it's okay. You can stand up too. That's awesome. Let me ask you a question. I mean, because I've asked this to students. One word. Summarize the Bible school in one word. The thing you hear is change. Change. I've been changed. I have been changed. Is that true? Yes. Let me see. Who, who says that's true? I have been changed. Yeah. Yes, thank you. I'm trying to prove a point. Needed some evidence. It's about a change. So you can sit there and learn and be there physically, but it has to get in you. Because revival can't be taught. It must be caught. The anointing comes by association, by relationship. You catch the anointing. Anointing comes by impartation. You got to take it. You can know all the scriptures, 
about the anointing. You can know all the scriptures about prosperity and still be in poverty. Amen. Amen. I knew all the scriptures about giving. And I was a giver. I was a tither and I, I gave. But one day, I'm sitting in a service. And the Lord challenges me to do something I had never done before. Empty out my bank account. There wasn't much. There was only $600 in there. But when, when it's all you have, it's a lot. When you're a Bible school student, you're sitting there and that's all you got. And you still have bills to pay. And you got this big vision stirring, up, stirring on the inside of you about going to the nations. And, and the Lord says, give it all. And my knees started having fellowship one with the other. My hands was shaking as I'm writing that bank check. But the moment I put that in the, because you see, it wasn't about, I had to overcome fear. I had to break through. And the breakthrough had to happen on the inside of me. So when I released that offering, it was the most radical thing I had done in terms of giving. Everything broke. I mean, it exploded on the inside of me. I've shared this many, many times. I shared this last week. I mean, it just exploded on the inside of me. It was like revelation just exploded on the inside of me. A fire got hit me. I started running around, and I'm shouting, I am rich. I am rich. I mean, I shouted, I am rich. I am rich. I'm rich because I, I got it. I, I, I understood it. I just, I don't know how to say it. I got it. I got it. We used to sing this song. I, I got it. I got it. Something about the Holy Ghost, I can't explain it, but I got it in my hands, got it in my feet, got it in my walk, I got it in my talk, I got it all over me, I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it. There's something about the Holy Ghost, I can't explain it, but I got it in my hands, I got it in my feet, I got it in my walk, I got it in my talk, I got it all over me. We got to resurrect that one. That's a good one. You can't explain it. I couldn't explain it. It exploded on the inside of me. I have this treasure in an earthen vessel. I am rich. It just exploded. I'm rich. I am abundantly supplied for every good work God's called me to do. I don't have to live in fear. I don't have to worry about where the provision will come from. I just have to do what God's called me to do. I just obey. I just go on this journey and He will be with me. Like Moses said, Lord, I will not go unless you come with me. Because I'm going on a journey. It's a journey of faith. And I'm trusting God every single day. And He's with me. He will lead me in the path of righteousness for His name's sake. He will furnish a table for me in the wilderness, in the presence of my enemies. So it's a journey. You're on this journey. And in the beginning, it's like some baby steps. I'm telling you, it felt like baby steps. I mean, there were days I had to believe God for $20. $20. Maybe right now you are in that place where you're having to believe God for $20. $20. What is $20? Now I have to believe God for $20,000. You know. Then I have to, I'm going to have to believe God for $200,000. Then I'm going to have to believe God for $2 million. Then, so you walk, you walk, you're on this journey, and you have to continually grow and change. And Amen. And so it's this process of prosperity. And then there's a purpose attached to it. I'm not just trying to get things. I'm trying to get somewhere. The journey is not to get things. The journey is about getting somewhere and accomplishing something. And then one day at the end of my journey, standing before the Lord to hear, well done good and faithful servant or steward enter now in to unlimited prosperity Amen. unlimited prosperity that's heaven unlimited prosperity unlimited 
Roste la mambro di asta pacanda baronde anda bossa praia di liste camayando la bossa calabacit robroste che le anda la baca prosperity because I, I don't have the words in the English language to describe it how do you describe something heavenly with an earthly tongue you can't and I couldn't all I could shout was I'm rich I'm rich. That's all I could shout. But, I mean, there was so much more going on on the inside of me that night. And it just exploded. Revelation exploded on the inside. And you see, once you have revelation, it's yours. No one can take that away from me. Once you have revelation, it's yours. Once you got it, it's yours. You, you, you have it. No one can take that away. No one can take that away. Have you found 1 Corinthians 16? <laughs> no, I'm still there. Because affluence is a way of making people soft. So you got to stay on the cutting edge. I mean, you got you got to be in the front line. Of the battle. Because if you end up like King David, when you're supposed to be going to fight a war and you stay in the palace, the comf comfy, comf comfortable, cushy comfort of the palace, you're just kind of walking around and then you see a woman taking a bath. And you get yourself in big trouble. One thing leads to another. Now you're a murderer. Adulterer and a murderer and a liar. Oh my. What? How did I get here? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you how you got there. You stopped fighting. You got in the flesh. You, got, you just got comfortable. You got soft when you should have been out there fighting. Staying sharp. Staying on the cutting edge. Pressing forward. And that's, that's a key. Amen. So, uh, have you found 1 Corinthians 16? I, I will try to close with this. I, I don't know how many times I'll close. Because we have a, a starting time for these meetings, but we never have a closing time. You know that. <laughs> and we have a bunch of people that just love the word and they don't want to go anywhere. Hallelujah. Unless you eat of my flesh... And drink of my blood. You have no part of me. You're welcome to leave now. Okay, you're still here. All right. I, I can go on for a few more minutes. Another hour? <laughs> First Corinthians 16, verse 1. Now, concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. On the first day of the week, that's Sunday, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper. So according to the level of prosperity, basically, is what he's saying. According to the level of prosperity where you're at, lay aside something. That there, <clears throat> that there be no collections when I come. And when I come... Whomever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem. But if it is fitting that I go also, they will go with me. So here's the instruction of the Apostle Paul. And I'll read that from the Amplified. On the first day of each week, verse 2. Let each one of you personally put aside something and save it up as he has prospered in proportion to what he is given. So that no collections will need to be taken after I come. So, our giving is according to the proportion of our prosperity. Amen. There was a woman that gave two might. And Jesus said she had given more than all of them. Even though all the others had given a lot in terms of the amount. But the thing was they gave out of their abundance. So they actually were not giving enough. They should have been given a lot more. Because of the abundance that they have. So, as you grow in abundance, you have to increase your giving. 
you have to keep increase your, increase, increasing your giving. An evangelist I know was talking about it. He used to, at the time, was doing these big mass open air crusades in Africa, and going in different countries and whatever. And it was a businessman that came and said that he would support his ministry a certain amount. I can't remember. It was, let me say it was $50,000 or something a year. And he did that for a few years. But as the man did that, he began to really prosper. He became a millionaire, then a multimillionaire. I mean, his business went from being local to regional and then international. And now he's making millions and millions and millions. And he was increasing his giving. You know, 50000 went up to 100000 and then whatever. And then it got to the point where his giving was now had to be a million dollars. Now, it seems like a big amount. Wow, a million dollars. So he calls up the evangelist and says, you know, I'm sorry, I can't give anymore. And the evangelist said, why not? He goes, because my giving now is a million dollars. A million dollars is a lot. And then he asks him, how much did you make last year? What was your income? He said, well, 50 million. He says, well, forget about giving a million. You should be giving five million. So don't get all boastful about giving a million when you're actually robbing God, four million. So don't walk around talking about what a big giver you are. Actually, you need to realize what a big thief you are and repent. And so it's just amazing, you know, but it's really in proportion. But what happens as you prosper and somehow the, the, the numbers grow of the proportion, it, it, people have a hard time parting with it now. You know, because now they begin to think about all the things they could do with that million. No, because I, I, let me tell you, you laugh at this. I've actually dealt with that here. I've actually dealt with that here. There was a man that, at the time, coming to our church, a businessman, and and then I, I was talking to him, and and I noticed it was funny. Every service, I mean, he put in twenty dollars. Twenty dollars. $20, $20. The man had a, a, an airline or something. I can't remember. He had a number of businesses and all kinds of properties and stuff. $20, $20, $20, $20. Like clockwork. Beep, 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 $20. Beep, 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 $20. So one day I'm talking to him. And, you know, he's talking a big game to me. He came to visit me. He's talking up this, you know. Big brother, big buck speech I'm getting, you know. I said, hey, I've noticed something. I said, you always give a 20. I said, I know you've got to be making a lot more with everything you're telling me. Either you're making up stories or you really have all these things. And I mean, you know, sounds like you should be able to easily give 2,000, 5,000. You know, look, I've been talking about the different needs we have. You know, look. I said, I said, for three months, we've been trying to raise money for something. I can't remember what it was. I said, you could have just paid that off just like that. Three months. You know, I said, can you not do something? I said, look, you're, you're a businessman. You're telling me about all this that you have and you do and whatever. I said, look, three months. I've been trying to, I, th I can't remember. I think it was a camera or camera equipment. I can't remember. We're trying to raise money for something. Three months. I'm trying to raise $5,000 or something. The man could have just easily given it. I said, why do you always give 20? Here's what he said to me. He says, because you're just a small church. Ah. So that's all we, all, we only deserve 20 bucks, huh? You just, throwing crumbs, I'm just some dog that's going to lick the crumbs from your table, huh? You arrogant, prideful. I thought of a few other things to say. I said, I think you should just find yourself another small church and to throw your 20 bucks. Don't come here to throw bones at me. God called me to shake this nation. Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are, man? I don't need your money. You need my anointing. Don't come here to try to talk me down like you're some big hotshot. You're nothing. You are nothing in the kingdom. You are the least in the kingdom. Who do you think you are? You're nothing because... You don't nothing for the kingdom. I don't even care how much 
property you have, what you have. You can have an airline, airplane, whatever you have. I don't really even care. You're nothing. You're, as long as you're doing nothing for the kingdom, you are nothing in the kingdom. I said, get out of my face. Get lost. You're not going to come here and talk down to me like this and make me feel like I'm some loser. You're the loser. Get out of here. I'm serious. I'm not going to put up with that. God called me. I know my calling. God's anointed me. And I've had other people come around making promises like that. I've had people come to try to control the church with their money. Take a hike right there. There's the door, buddy. There's the door. There's the exit sign. Don't let the door hit you where the good Lord split you. <laughs> Pastor Merrick was telling me a story. Listen, because I called him. In the middle of one of these situations, I was talking to him. I called him and I was telling him what happened. Because he's an older man of God. He's been through a lot more. So I've got a, a number of people. And that was a time, you know, he's been a mentor to me in many ways. And I'm, I'm talking. I called him. He said, he said, Brother Corey, let me tell you a story. <laughs> Brother Corey, let me tell you a story. Sound like him? <laughs> he, said, he said, one time there was these three businessmen that came to my office in the church. And again, I'm not going to remember all the details. But these were businessmen and they had some money. And they basically were trying to buy their way into eldership or control of the church. And so they made him an offer. We'll give this much and... Between us, we make this much, and we'll give this much, and then da 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 da, and then we want this position, that kind of this, whatever. <laughs> Pastor Merrick said, "Hey," he said, "Guys, let me make you a better deal. I'll give you three minutes to go outside to repent." For your wife's sake, for your children's sake, I give you three minutes to repent unless you end up lepers and split hell wide open. I can't remember what happened to the man. He said, Brother Corey, you go look him right in the eye and you tell him. They got three minutes to repent. <laughs> Sound like Pastor Mary. That's how he talks. They got three minutes to repent. <laughs> One for each of you. And that's grace. Because I could have said one minute. You got one minute. I give you three minutes. That's abundance of grace. <laughs> that's abundance of grace. So. I told the man, I don't need your money. The Lord's going to provide. And the Lord did provide. Whatever he pledged publicly, behind the scenes, there were strings attached. You, know, you can stand up and say, I give this much. But then behind the scenes, they come, hey, brother, uh, we're waiting on that pledge. You publicly pledged. You know. Oh, yeah, about that pledge. Um, I want this, I want this, I want this, I want that, I want this, I want that. Oh, whoa, 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 where are we going with this? You know, and I had another time I had one man come up to me and says, what are you doing with my money? <laughs> Just like that. What are you doing with my money? I said, I'm not doing anything with your money. I don't have your money. You have your money. He says, no, the money I put in the offerings. I said, oh, you mean God's money. You're asking me about God's money? Because it's not your money. It's God's money. And we're doing God's work. He says, how do I know you're doing God's work? I said, if you don't know it, then just go find another place you, where you believe they're doing God's work. So don't come to question me. If you don't believe I'm doing God's work, then why are you even here? But he says, oh, no, no, no. He says, but you are very anointed. That's why I'm here. He says, you're very anointed. I'm, I'm here. You are very anointed. He says, you have a great anointing. I trust the anointing. I said, oh, so you trust me with the anointing, but you don't trust me with money. Jesus said, if you are not trustworthy with money, you will not even receive the anointing. So if I'm anointed, then it means I must be doing something right with the money. Uh. Ooh, I never thought of it that way. That's the problem. You think too much. 
And there's stuff in there that needs to really get cleaned up. It's a mess in there right now. It's a big mess. It needs to really get cleaned up. So, we give according to our level. Amen. And then, of course, you know, we need to, I'll close with this. No, I promise. I, I will. I will. I'll try my best. It's not my fault, but it's the Holy Ghost. Don't blame me. Just follow the Holy Ghost. Is that all right? Ha. <laughs> huh. <laughs> Put it on the Holy Ghost. He can take it. Acts 2.44. Bible says they had all things in common. They had all things in common. People brought everything they had, and they had all things in common. What does that tell you? There was a even, I don't want to say even in terms of amount, but there was a, let's say there was a just distribution of wealth in the church. They had all things in common. The wealthy didn't say, I'm wealthy, and I'm going to get wealthier. They were willing to share, and they had all things in common. So... Because that's God's, you know, when God took the children of Israel into the promised land, He evenly divided up to every family, to every tribe, He gave land. Everyone received a portion. And everyone was blessed. Everyone had enough and more than enough, actually. It was a land of abundance, overflowing with milk and honey. Until then, in the desert, they had just enough. But they still were supplied on a daily basis but once they got into the promised land now they have more than enough and every family had received more than enough portion it wasn't like god just took a few people put them right at the top gave them 95 percent of the land and then took the rest of the people and just stuck them in a little corner put them in a little ghetto he didn't just take and put some people up in a mansion and the rest in a ghetto no god wanted to make sure that everybody had an abundance that's how God sees. He wants to make sure that everyone, all of his children are blessed. That's the kingdom mentality. That's the kingdom way. Prosperity for all, not just a few. The few is the world's way. Prosperity for all. Dearly beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things. For all the beloved, God loves his children. God loves all of his children. And he wants them every one of them, to always have all sufficiency for every good work and be abundantly supplied and receive all grace. Amen. And then look at Acts 4.32. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own. They did not have an ownership mentality. This is very dangerous. When the prosperity message comes with an ownership mentality, it's dangerous. You don't own anything. We are all stewards. Amen. Amen. Adam and Eve were blessed. They were blessed and God took them and put them in the garden. But he didn't put them to, there to just to sleep under the tree. He said, I have an assignment for you. Keep this place going. I give you an assignment. Keep this place going. Guard this place. Take care of this place. Keep sowing, keep sowing, keep sowing, keep increasing, keep being more fruitful, keep multiplying, keep taking dominion over all the earth. I've given you this, because remember, the Garden of Eden had boundaries. It was in a certain location, but it wasn't supposed to stay that way. He was supposed to take the Garden of Eden, multiply it, and fill the whole earth with it. Basically, turn the whole earth into paradise. That's the blessing. But, just because you have the blessing doesn't mean... Because this is what people think now. Well, we're under the New Testament. We have, we're under grace. We're not under the law. So we don't have to tithe. Or we don't have to give. Yeah, it's, that's true. You don't have to do anything, really. Because you're under grace, you don't have to do anything. Under the law, you have to. Because you're under grace, you don't have to do anything. You're not going to give out of compulsion or out of necessity. 
For God loves a cheerful giver. It's not that you have to. It's that you want to. To whom much is given, much is expected. I don't, I'm not doing it because I have to. I, that, that was, I came out of that. That was Islam. I had to go pray five times a day because I had to to get into heaven. I don't have to. Do, yes, you're right. You're under grace. You don't have to do anything. It's not because you have to. It's because you want to. You are free to do it. You do, you do it joyfully. You do it cheerfully. You give cheerfully because even though you are blessed and you have all the grace, you still have to be a good steward. It's all about stewardship. It's all about stewardship of what you have. You be a good steward. You be a good steward. When you're a good steward, you realize you don't own anything. Everything belongs to God. That's why they were able to sell their land, sell their houses, and come and put the money at the apostles' feet. Because it was not their own. They didn't see it as my property, my house, my this, my that. It's all God's. And they wanted to make sure that it was evenly distributed, that everybody was well supplied. Because that's God's heart. When you carry God's heart, when you're a giver, you give because you want to be a blessing. You're not giving to get. You're giving to be a blessing. You want to make sure that others are blessed. It's more blessed to give than to receive. So you give because you get more joy out of seeing others blessed. But if you're just always hoarding up for yourself, that's a problem. When the preachers live like kings and the congregation members live like paupers, there's a problem. Amen? And that's not God's way. That's not God's way. And then there are all these different teachings that come. There was a, there was a teaching some years ago, kings and priests teaching. Are you a king or a priest? One, one businessman said, I'm a king. He said, he said, you're a priest. I said, no. I said, I'm a king and a priest. I'm a royal priesthood. I'm a king and a priest. So don't try to put that on the church. Are you a king? Or he's a businessman. He's a king. So he can live like a king. No, 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 no. We're all kings and priests. So all, all kinds of weird stuff come and go. But we stay on course. We are on a journey. We are on a journey. It's a journey of faith. It's a journey of believing God. Every day you believe God. Well, I, I just can't believe God anymore. I've gone through so much. No, you believe God. You believe God. You believe God. You believe God. Where is my breakthrough? You keep believing God. 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 You, believing God. you, you keep trusting the Lord. Trust in Him. Trust in Him. Trust in Him. Every day, believe. Every day, trust. Every day, hope. Every day, speak. Walk by faith. Walk by faith. Don't stop. Keep walking. You'll get somewhere. Amen. Keep walking by faith. You'll get somewhere. Keep walking by faith. Keep running your race. You'll finish it one day. Keep running your race. Keep running your race. Just keep running your race. You'll finish it one day. Keep your eye on the prize. Keep your eye in, uh, on the eternal prize, on the heavenly rewards. Be focused on eternity. Forget about the things of the world. Forget about it. Forget. Don't be attached to these things. Don't let... Don't let material things, don't let natural things distract you. Don't even let natural things discourage you. Well, if I just get this thing, I'm going to be happy. No! Because there's always a better car. There's always a newer car. There's always a bigger house. There's always something. The Apostle Paul said, if I have food and clothing, I'm content with that. I'm just going to do. I've been in abundance. I've been in lack. He's been in prison. And he dined with kings. And he didn't care about those things. He just wanted to run his race. And I'm telling you, I don't know about you, but the longer I run my race, the, the more insignificant some of these things of the earth become, really, to be honest with you. The 
things that I thought I had to have to be happy years ago, I, they don't even mean anything, to be honest with you. To be honest with you, all those things, if I had a lot of those things, I, I wouldn't even be able to do my ministry. It would be a distraction. I don't even have time, to be honest with you, for those things. Some of the things that you think you want to do, Time is short. Passes you by so quickly. When you're 80 years old and you look back, what are you going to really remember? What do you want people to remember about you? All the things you had or all the things you did? All the things you did. And people are only going to remember you for all the things you did for them. I was reading in this book, and this very, very, very wealthy businessman, multi, multi millionaire, billionaire, on his deathbed, he said, I wish I had spent more time with my family than in the office, you know. At the end of his life, he realized what was really important. Amen. You're, anybody ever heard about the Midas touch? King Midas, who lived somewhere here in Turkey way back. He loved gold so much. He kept, he, kept, he, he kept hoarding up gold. He had so much gold that he had more, more gold than anybody in the world. But it wasn't enough. One day in a dream, this being appeared to him at night in a dream. He said, ask of me, make a wish of me that I will grant you. Midas said, I want everything I touch to turn to gold. Next day he woke up and he remembered the dream and so he reached over and touched the, the bedpost that was made of wood and it turned into pure gold. He said, wow! And he started running around his palace touching the walls. Everything was turning to gold. He went and touched the flowers. They turned to gold. He went and touched the trees in the garden. Everything turned to gold. He went to a statue, touched it, turned to gold. He thought, yes, I have it. I have the, the golden touch, he said. Then it was time for breakfast. He sat down. They put his breakfast in front of him. He reached out to eat an apple, turned to gold. He reached out to grab an egg, turned to gold. He reached out to grab the bread, turned to gold. He, he wanted to drink water, turned to gold. He thought, oh my goodness, what will I do, what will I do? And then his wife had died, and the only thing he had left was his beloved, beautiful daughter. And she came running up behind him, said, daddy, daddy, good morning, and grabbed him, and she turned to gold. And he broke down crying on his face. He realized that he had the golden touch that he could turn everything to gold but how empty his life was and he broke down crying 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 and that night he went to bed miserable man miserable and the being appeared to him and he said please take away the golden touch take away the golden touch i don't want gold i just want my daughter back I want to be able to taste that apple. I want to be able to smell the flowers. I want to be able to drink some water. I'm dying of thirst. I'm thirsty. I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. I'm hungry. I want to be able to feel the soft touch skin of my beautiful daughter. I want to be able to tell her I love her. She's turned into a golden statue. Please, please take this away. And the being said, I, I take it away. He woke up the next morning. First thing he did, he ran to his daughter. Touched his daughter and she came back to life. She was normal again. He hugged her and he hugged her and said, yes, this is the only thing that matters. You're the most important thing to me. Then he said, bring me an apple. <laughs> bring me an apple from my orchard. He had the best apples in the land in his orchard. He bit into that apple, and, oh, that juicy, tasty apple. He said, yes, yes, quick, give me a glass of water. I'm dying of thirst. 
He drank that water from his spring. He thought, oh, it tastes so good. And he realized that the simple things in life were the most important and the most satisfying. Amen. And I'll close with that. So, just remember, just remember, enjoy the journey. Enjoy the journey. Run your race. Trust God. Believe God. He'll prosper you. He'll bless you. Keep doing the work. Amen. Keep doing the work. He said he will bless everything you lay hands on. He'll bless the work of your hands. So, it's not about touching something to turn into gold, but just... Work hard. Work hard with your hands. Work hard with your hands. You are blessed. Amen. Enjoy life. Enjoy the, the beautiful things. Enjoy the simple things. And amen. amen. Hallelujah.